time to take a short look at Japanese Navy bomber tactics against ships in World War II. Now there are basically three types of attack. The dive bomber attack, which started at an altitude of around 3000 meters, and then entered into the final stage at around 1500 meters. The torpedo bomber attack, which was carried out at an altitude between 5 to 50 meters. And finally, the level bomber attack, at an altitude of 3000 meters. These three types of attacks were performed by the D-3A Val and the B-5N Kate in the early and mid-war carrier battles. The Japanese Navy also used land-based bombers, the Riku units, but this video will focus on carrier-borne bombers. The dive bomber attacks were mainly carried out by the D-3A Val, which could be equipped with an up to 250 kg bomb in the center and two 60 kg bombs on the wings, although the 60 kg bombs were usually not part of a regular loadout. Similar to the German dive bomber the Junkers 87 Stucker, the D3A only had a non-retractable landing gear. Yet the major drawback of the D3A against its US counterpart was the limited bomb load, whereas the SPD Dauntless could easily carry a 454kg bomb, the largest single bomb of the D3A was 250kg. The bomber for torpedo and level bombing was the B5 and codenamed Kate by the Allies. For torpedo bombing it was equipped with the Type 91 torpedo with a weight of 835 kg, but later versions even had more weight. The range of these torpedoes was usually at 2000 meters at a speed of 41 knots. The Japanese torpedo was superior to US torpedoes in the early war in reliability and speed. Additionally it could be dropped at a higher altitude and speed, hence the Japanese torpedo planes had a significant advantage when it came to the early weapon loadouts. For level bombing the Kate was usually equipped with an 800 kg bomb. Now before we take a closer look at the various tactics, be aware that the depicted flights are not necessarily individual planes, but show ties or even two ties. The first consists of three planes, the second usually of two or three show ties, thus six or nine planes. Now let's look at the tactics. Japanese dive bomber tactics against ships were developed and improved during the mid 1930s. And with the capabilities of the D3A, this could be further improved. The bomber formations approached the targeted ship from the front at a distance of around 17 to 22 kilometers. Initially, the attack run began at an altitude of 3000 meters. They would enter a shallow dive at around 20 to 30 degree until they reached an altitude of 1500 meters. Now they would enter a steep dive at an angle of around 55 to 60 degree. The bombs would be dropped at an altitude of around 600 meters. Now several formations would approach the target simultaneously from different angles, usually about 10 to 20 degree to the right and left, thus reducing the chances of the ship evading the attack. Now one major problem with these attacks besides dodging enemy fighter attacks was the anti-aircraft fire. In order to counter these problems there were two types of bombs used. The regular bombs for anti-shipping attacks were semi-armor piercing bombs with 250 kg, whereas the second type was a high explosive bomb with 242 kg. The latter was used by the initial attackers. They should inflict damage and suppression against the anti-aircraft guns and crews of the targeted ship. We know that during the Battle of Midmay, one flight was equipped with two thirds of the planes carrying same armor piercing bombs and one third with high explosive bombs for flak suppression. Now if we take a closer look at the dive bomber attack against the USS Yorktown at the Battle of Midway, the dive bombers didn't attack from the front, but from behind and the side. Although in that case the formation also had been shot up badly and planes attacked individually. As always in combat there are various variations due to the circumstances or tactical considerations. Nevertheless the first attackers dropped high explosive bombs, meant for flux suppression. Hence there was probably still some cohesion and coordination in the unit left. Now torpedo bombing tactics were surprisingly similar to the dive bombing tactics in the initial approach. In this case the bomber approached also from the front, but then spread out more widely at a distance of around 16 to 19 kilometers. As a result they would attack from both sides, minimizing the chances of the attack avoiding the torpedoes. The torpedoes would be launched at an altitude of between 5 to 50 meters, at a distance of 800 to 1200 meters. Note that these distances and altitudes were initially lower, but in order to prevent planes from colliding with each other, the values were increased for safety reasons. Sadly my sources don't have a detailed description of the intended purpose of the center group in the diagram. Justin assumes that the torpedoes would be dropped from the front too, so that the target vessel would expose its broadside to two of the three torpedo spreads, regardless of what evasive action it undertook. Now if we look at the attack on the USS Yorktown during the Battle of Midway, we can see again that there was not an approach from the front, but from behind and the side. 
Although the group that attacked from behind spread out to the left and right after passing the outer defensive screen. Whereas the second group only attacked from one side, yet at this point the Yorktown was already in an invading turn and the Japanese had taken considerable losses and ultimately it was this group that scored the hits. Now level bombing tactics are usually associated with large multi-engine land based bombers, yet they were also used by the Japanese with single engine naval bombers. Although the Japanese gathered much more experience in this form attack during the war against China, their currency stayed rather poor. Yet during the planning on the attack on Pearl Harbor, Navy technicians concluded that dive and torpedo bombers might not be sufficient and thus revised and improved the doctrine for level bomber attacks. For this the altitude was lowered to 3000 meters, the formation tightened up and training increased. These changes clearly paid off by increasing the hit chance considerably and during the attack the USS Arizona was sunk due to these attacks. Yet later during the war this success couldn't be repeated. And for the Battle of Midway there is no indication that the Japanese used a level bomber attack against Allied shipping. What I found particularly interesting about the Pearl Harbor level bombing attack was that the B-5N were equipped with bombs that were converted from armor piecing naval artillery shells. If one looks at tactics it's always important that these require a substantial amount of coordination. And in the early stages of the war the Japanese Navy carrier force achieved a level of coordination that surpassed all other navies. They would use a combination of dive, torpedo and level bombing attacks that were protected and supported by fighter aircraft which could for instance draft enemy ships to suppress the anti-aircraft fire. To quote directly from the book Shattered Sword. In multi-division attacks an entire carrier division of two carriers would contribute matched air groups to the overall effort, launching both of its dive bomber units for instance, while a second division would launch its two carrier attack bomber units consisting of torpedo bombers. These four squadrons, 70 or more combat aircraft, would be escorted by fighters contributed by all four carriers. On follow up strikes the air group composition would be reversed, with the first division sending up its torpedo bombers and the second contributing the dive bombers. The result was that the Japanese carrier could launch large, well balanced strikes against their enemies. To give you some idea of the level of sophistication, the US Navy didn't achieve this until late 1943, early 1944. To summarize, the Japanese Navy used three anti-shipping tactics for the carrier borne aircraft. Dive, torpedo and level bombing. Although the later was only successfully used against the Anschutz fleet at Pearl Harbor. Thus during the early war after Pearl Harbor dive and torpedo bombing were the fundamental tactics that led to the major successes. Of course tactics alone don't explain the victories. The operational level was probably even of greater importance similar to the Germans that used their panzers with great success on the operational level by using dedicated panzer division and corps. The Japanese were able to use the carrier force effectively operationally, thus multiplying the tactical capabilities by deploying multidivisional strike groups in a coordinated attack. The doctrines behind these coordinated attacks combined with a well trained attack force deploying modern carriers combined with carrier borne aircraft against a poorly prepared and generally ill equipped force led to the first six months of victories of the Imperial Japanese Navy against the US and Royal Navy. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. Special thanks to my Patreons who supported this video by providing funds to buy the following books used for this video. As always all sources are linked in the description. Also thanks to Justin for advice and helping me out on this video. If you liked what you saw consider watching this video on why the Japanese air forces failed or a video about the attack on Pearl Harbor. Thank you for watching and see you next time.